Welcome everyone to session two of your certification where we take you beyond the checklist. My name is Victoria Guillo and I'll be your instructor today. I'm known as the stage coach. I am an award-winning professional home stager of 10 years. I've been in the real estate industry for over 30 years total. I've been featured as one of America's ultimate experts in Woman's World magazine. And I'm the author of a book of staging tips that is selling in England and Germany as well as the United States. And today, I want to share some tips for you as real estate agents that will help you boost your profits and it will make your lives a lot easier. So I hope that something clicks for you as we go through this and it really propels your business to the next level. So let's recap what you've learned so far in certification. You've learned how much of an impact staging can have on the selling price, as much as 6 to 13 percent. You've seen how much faster staged homes sell versus unstaged homes, on average 40 percent faster. You've learned how much improvement can be made uh, for free or for very little investment. And you've learned which improvements yield the greatest returns. So that helps you counsel your sellers on where they should devote their time and their, their resources. For example, lightening and brightening, cleaning and decluttering, landscaping, even furniture arrangements, plumbing, electrical, kitchens and baths. These are all areas where you can reap great rewards for very little uh, in the way of resources. You've learned how to use staging, or you're about to learn, how to use staging to prospect differently and get in front of more clients. And when you do that, it'll help you take more listings. And because they show better, it's going to help you sell more listings. So I'm going to give you access to some more tools at the end of today's session that will help you even more in your listing presentations. And that'll help you boost the number of, uh, of clients that you convert to listings. So today what I'd like to cover, taking you beyond the checklist after you've performed that, I want to show you how to recognize situations where you may want to refer or should refer to a specialist. Um, you should consider yourself like a general practitioner, but there are times where general practitioners will call in a specialist and um, I'm, I want to show you some situations where you know this is a circumstance where you should. We're going to talk about broadening your buyer pool, eliminating excuses that your potential buyers might have either to walk away and put in an offer on a different property or to give you a lowball offer on your listing. We'll talk about the assets and how you want to draw the buyer's eyes to those assets. You need to know how much does the seller need to do without doing more than they need to. How do you know when they've done enough to get the listing sold without going beyond. We're going to talk about knowing your competition and how your listing stacks up against the competition and knowing your target buyer. We're going to discuss the priority areas where you really want to focus when talking about staging. I'm going to share some paint tips with you today and we're going to talk a little bit about the psychology of selling. And then we're going to talk about your online listing photos. They're so important. And I'm going to share some very basic furniture arrangement uh, recommendations with you. And again, not to teach you to become a stager yourself and do the decorating, but to teach you to recognize those scenarios where you should be calling in a specialist because you know that there's an easy, good improvement that could be made with good benefit. And then we'll talk about what happens when you find yourself in a situation where your very cooperative seller has cleaned and decluttered to the point where you're left with a very blank slate. So now what? And then when you work with the stager as a specialist, um, I want to share some, some tips on how to work well with them. Because you want to focus on your strengths, which are marketing. And there are certain benefits to bringing in a pro and and makes a difference what your timing is when you do that too. So we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about how not to sell a house. Because I think you can learn a great deal from mistakes of others. 
uh, and it will sort of recap all of the things that we've talked about and put things into perspective. So let's start with broadening the buyer pool. Staging is a two-part process. It involves preparing a property and presenting it for sale. The first course that you've completed in your certification has covered preparation exceedingly well. Today, we're going to focus on the presentation half of staging as it applies to real estate agents. Your basic goal is to make your house, your, your seller's house, appeal to the broadest possible pool of target buyers, and that's how you create demand for the listing. And you're going to do that by identifying all the potential negatives in a property and seeing which of these we can eliminate and which of these we can minimize so that the buyer won't be tempted to go somewhere else or throw in a very low offer. So we'll, we're going to talk about the common turnoffs and how to eliminate them, and we're going to talk about the common assets and some tips on drawing the buyer's attention to those assets. And we're going to, your other goal is creating a sense of harmony and tranquility. It's a very elusive sense, but it says, I don't know what it is about this house, but this one just feels like home. And any of you who have been in the industry for any length of time have certainly had many buyers uh, come to you with a rational checklist that says, I want the following features in a house, and I won't settle for anything less. It has to have three bedrooms. It has to have two baths. I need a gas stove, and I need a two-car garage. And they'll fall in love with a house that has electric cooking, and uh, maybe it has one and a half baths but it felt right. They could picture their lives in it. It hit their emotional hot button. And so that tells us that emotion trumps ration. And staging is all about helping you hit that emotional hot button. So what are the priority areas that we want to focus on when staging for the presentation aspects? Well, as you learned in the first session, curb appeal is huge because they won't get out of the car to see the inside if they don't like what they see on the outside. And you usually need feet through the door to sell a listing. So curb appeal is your first priority. Nail that, and your second priority becomes everything you see in that first view from the entry. So you've got a few seconds ticking away while uh, the lockbox is being opened and your clients are, are, the potential buyers are sitting on the doorstep looking around. And then the door opens, and they walk inside, and they have that first sweeping view. Studies show that people will form a first impression in anywhere from 5 to 15 seconds. You don't have long. So what they see from that entry is pretty much forming their impression of that property. You want it to be a good one. The challenge in this comes from the fact that in the medium-sized homes in this country, you typically enter and you see a formal dining room on one side and a formal living room on the other. And typically in these homes, those rooms are used only when they're entertaining large crowds, when it's their turn to host Thanksgiving dinner, for example. So these are rooms that are many times not used, not lived in, and they tend to feel that way. So if you walk in and you feel a sterile room that has, nobody set foot in that room for 20 years, you have a challenge of making that feel inviting and dream home because your buyer is trying to picture their dream lifestyle in those rooms, and this is your first chance to catch their interest. So they have to live up to it. Then kitchens, bathrooms, and master bedrooms are your next priorities. Don't overlook the final view as you leave the house because that's going to leave a lasting impression. And I liken this to the example of a stay in a fine hotel. Chocolate's on the pillow, the bed's turned down, the comforter is so comfortable, and the lovely plush bathrobe they left. It's been a delightful experience. And you go to check out, and they've made an error in your bill, and the clerk is not resolving it to your satisfaction, and it leaves a little sour taste in your mouth as you leave, and it wipes out a lot of that glowing feeling you had. And it's the same with a house. So check for fingerprint smudges around the door on the way out. Check for no dog nose smudges in the storm door on the way out, and things like that. 
let's talk about the most common turnoffs that I see as I go through homes. A drab, colorless exterior can turn off a buyer. Dingy window treatments or overly elaborate, fancy, overly elaborate swags, very personal taste patterns or window treatments. Dated carpets can turn off buyers or one of my personal favorites, pink in the girls' bedroom, blue in the boys' bedroom, beige down the hall. Um, that can turn off buyers. We all know that dated kitchens and baths are turnoffs for them. I'm going to go out on a limb and say florals everywhere or taste-specific patterns, even if they're in their furniture. And you may be sitting there thinking, yes, but the buyers aren't looking at their furniture. They're looking at the house, and they can see past that. Well, I'd like to to point out that studies show that 85% of the buyers cannot picture very well. And although they want to be looking at the architecture of the house, they're very much influenced by the overall feel of a house. And the furnishings will drive that feel. So you might have a home that has beautifully updated walls and flooring, but they've got grandma's inherited furniture. The buyer is going to go through and feel like the house is dated and it's really not the house, it's the furnishings. So that can turn off a, a, a buyer, potentially. Worn and stained recliners can turn off a buyer. If it feels cramped, buyers are looking for light and space. Cramped can turn them off, and so can dark. It's another turn off. If you walk in and you see dated 1980s brass and glass light fixtures all over, that turns off buyers. Very strong wall color and, and very personal taste colors can turn off buyers. And you learned in your last session that 85% of the buyers don't want to do any work, not even painting. Wallpaper is a big turnoff, and that's a big sticky point. Uh, if you're in an area where wallpaper has been used a lot, um, it's tough to get the seller to address it, and the buyers don't want to address it either. So a, a lot of listings that linger have wallpaper in them. And reptiles can be a turnoff. I'll share the example of a house I was in last year. I walked in, and the dining room had been converted to a giant iguana cage, floor to ceiling. Big turnoff, creepy feeling. Um, and even the small cage with a snake sitting on a desk in a spare bedroom can be a turnoff. So rather than talk about anything on that later, we'll just say relocate them. They should take a vacation somewhere else while the house is being listed. So let's talk about how do we address those turnoffs now that we've identified them. Well, if you have a, a dingy exterior or a drab, your first step, as you learned in your previous session, is a good power wash. Everything inside and outside should sparkle. It should be clean and sparkling. But painting the front door or the trim in a fresh color or adding trim in a fresh color can completely update and freshen a uh, facade. Um, and you may not need to paint the whole house. You might just need to freshen up the paint. Much less expensive, and it can be, uh, it can be a, big, um, a big improvement in a property. And then your next step, landscaping. Because you learned in the previous course that that's your number one return on investment. You can add so much life and color with blooming plants. So here's an example of a very drab, dingy little wing um, on a house. Uh, did not say luxury lifestyle. It just looked tired. It looked low end. By simply painting the trim, we added extra trim and painted it in a fresh, updated color, and power washing the house, it already starts to feel a little bit more cheerful, and a, there's a little of the, a little less kind of run down feeling. Now, if you can picture a little window box and some landscaping under there, you can get to cottage charming as opposed to run down and slummy. Here's an example to show what lovely trim colors and just a little touch of greenery can do to add appeal to an exterior. And here's another example to show a simple window box, very inexpensive, can add so much charm. If you put your finger over that window box and look at the picture without it, it's a very boring facade. But when you add the window box, the curb appeal goes up considerably. We talked about dingy or dated window treatments being a turnoff. Well, sometimes all you have to do is remove them. It's free. Look at the example. The before on the left, we had short, 
uh, shears that had grayed slightly through the years. We ran them through the washing machine, and they still came out gray. And they were still short, which is a dated treatment. To the floor is a more current treatment. They blocked the light, made it feel a little uh, gloomy in there. And as soon as we removed them completely, we had great moldings around the window. The light came flooding in. It's free. That's all we needed to do. Because you're selling light, um, people are looking for light spaces, and because you're selling the windows and the architecture, not the furnishings, I recommend raising the blinds, exposing the maximum amount of window pane. You, you can see in this example, we raised the blinds, and we made it less about the bright red sofa and window treatments. We toned that down and made it more about the window. And something I did here, if you look closely, uh, I extended the drapery rod right and left. As I got an extra foot on each side, and I hung the window treatments to just to the outside of the window. So they're actually over wall and only an inch or two over the window. So I exposed the maximum amount of window pane. We got the most light coming in, and it made that window feel twice as big. And here's another example. A simple drape panel straight into the floor are your safest approach when you're selling. In the example in the before picture on the left, we had three different windows. Sorry I cut off the slider in the before picture, but you can use your imagination there. On the left window, we have just blinds. On the middle window, we have blinds and a ruffle valance. And the slider had the vertical plastic blinds. By unifying the window treatments and updating them with a simple to-the-floor panel, instead of looking like three awkward, different-sized, cluttery, um, cluttery approach to windows. We now, after the, the window treatments were changed, it looks like one big dramatic corner window. It looks much more uh, upscale and modern. And the windows look like a major architectural statement instead of three cluttery punctures in the wall. It made a big difference. I think the, the whole price point feels higher this way than it did before. Since light sells homes, another thing you can do to boost the sense of light is to make sure that you have no burned out light bulbs anywhere and you've increased the wattage in the lights to their maximum. If you have a dark corner, put a light fixture in the corner. Make sure there's light everywhere. That addresses dark. Now let's talk about cramped. Usually all you have to do is remove the excess furniture and that is free. Um, here's an example of a very high-end home. When you walked into the family room, instead of looking at architectural features, you walked in and it felt brown and it felt cramped. This is a very large room, and cramped is not something you should feel in a, in a large mansion home. So we removed 50% of the furniture and brought in a smaller area rug with some color. And we also... Uh, swapped out the window treatments for simple straight panels to the floor. The result? Look how much more sunlight bounces off the floors and comes in through the windows. You're not distracted by the brown swags at the windows. Your eye goes to the architectural features now. It goes to the beautiful windows, the hardwood floors, the sunlight gleaming. There was an incredible view through those windows, too, that we wanted them focused on. Um, it makes all the difference, and we just removed about 50% of the furniture. By removing excess furniture, we also contribute to a sense of peacefulness and tranquility, as you can see in this bedroom example. Here's another example. It's much more calming. It shows off the space better, and it just feels calmer. Another example, just calm things down by removing excess. We talked about dated or taste-specific patterns being a turnoff. Here are two examples. The home on the left was the master bedroom in a luxury home, high-priced. It had been on the market for five months, and the feedback to the selling agent had been, it's tired. It just needs wow factor. So here we're looking at a master bedroom that feels more like the guest room with the leftover furniture. And part of the reason it feels dated is the old floral bedspread that sort of says grandma's house. 
by simply turning it down and minimizing the amount of floral we saw and bringing in a nice white spread that she had, we updated the bedding treatment and we, we uh, decided to put up window treatments to add some color and boost the, the luxury factor in here. And the property, we found someone interested within three weeks after doing that. So it made all the difference. We didn't have to go to great expense. Look at the example on the right. This was the formal living room in a mid-priced home. This had been on the market for five months. No interest, very few showings. This was the view from the front door. If you walked in two steps and turned to the right, this was the formal living room. The seller had inherited her mother's furnishings from the 80s, and her little boys had jumped up and down on it, and they were quite stained and dirty. And this was not luxury first impression. But by simply covering up the fabric and window treatments again, we made this feel much fresher and much more inviting and cheerful. So you don't walk in and say dated anymore. It made all the difference. This property sold in five days after we staged it. Total cost in that room, by the way, $100. If you have dated cabinet finishes but they're in wonderful condition, consider painting. If the seller is good at painting themselves, it's an extremely inexpensive thing to do. Replacing hardware can sometimes be all you need to update and updating ceiling fixtures. In this before example, we had a high-end home, high-quality cabinets, um, but a dated finish. We had a dated 1980s brass and glass light fixture, and the rug and the, the breakfast area furniture felt a little dated. Tired was the word that everyone used. So for the cost of a can of paint and a $79 light fixture, this room was transformed. We took out the area rug, we moved the breakfast area furniture to the garage, and we brought in different pieces we, we just scavenged from around the house and put together a breakfast banquet area instead. It's the same appliances, same hardware, but it feels like a completely different home. This one uh, found an interested buyer within a couple of weeks after making these changes. So small changes can have a huge impact on the sale. Here's another example of a kitchen uh, and what paint can do. These were, uh, the sellers were in their 90s. They had to move. They'd been trying to sell for five months, and this kitchen was turning off all their prospective buyers. The cabinets were plastic fake wood, and the counters and the backsplash were a yellow formica. And so a can of paint later and some peel and stick uh, backsplash tiles, a total of $240. And this kitchen was no longer the major turnoff, and within a few weeks, this listing sold. Here's another example of a kitchen with a $438 uh, staging job. We painted out the old, it had, been, it had been on the market for seven months, and no takers, very little foot traffic, and we were convinced that it was the kitchen that was keeping everybody from visiting. So we painted out the oak strips, we replaced the faucet and hardware, added hardware, and we put a counter veneer down, and this property sold twice within a month. The first deal fell through, but it sold again, and within a month, so we sold twice in a month. Paint can go a long way, and so can bathroom light fixtures and faucets. Simply painting the walls in a soothing color, an updated color, uh, can make a huge difference. Here we replace the light fixture, and we also put up, since this was a high-end home, we spent some money on a, a peel and stick mirror that went over, a uh, mirror frame, rather, that went over the existing mirror. And it makes it feel so much more luxurious. Never underestimate the power of a can of paint. Here is just a change of paint and, and a few accessories. And it goes from chaotic to soothing and tranquil and spa-like. Those 1980s brass and glass light fixtures that turn off buyers, um, are in my area, you see them all over the, the McMansions in the entry halls, and that's your first impression. Changing out the light fixture there can be a big benefit. Uh, here in this example, you see uh, in the after, we painted, updated the paint color as well as changed out the light fixture, and it feels like a different house. 
If you're dealing with a kitchen that has mismatched appliances, so you've got a stainless steel stove and a black refrigerator and a white dishwasher, it makes the kitchen appear less expensive. But if they're in good working order, you don't necessarily want to spend the money to replace them. So there are veneers or skins that can be applied to appliances. Appliancart.com uh, is where I took these photos. These are snipped from their website, taken with permission. And uh, you can buy a stainless steel magnetic veneer. If you can stick a magnet on the fridge or the dishwasher, you can put a, a sheet of stainless steel. It magnetically adheres. It costs approximately $80 for a panel for the front of a refrigerator and approximately $40 for a panel for the front of a dishwasher. If a magnet won't stick, they have adhesive options. They're a little trickier to apply, but the option exists. And when you do that, it looks like you have a suite of stainless steel appliances. They also have a film. It's a thick vinyl film that goes over a perfectly smooth surface like Formica. It won't work over tile because you'll see the texture of the grout. But if you have a perfectly smooth surface, this film that comes in either a granite or a marble in several colors makes a wonderful option um, to upgrade the feel in the kitchen or a bathroom. It's still a synthetic material. You're not selling it as a stone, but a buyer is much happier accepting that than they are a very dated Formica, for example. So that's an option to keep in mind. And an island the size you see here is approximately, I'm going to guess, about $75, including shipping. It's a very inexpensive option. We talked about paint colors being a turnoff. Strong personal taste wall colors will definitely turn off buyers. And you learned that 85% of the buyers don't want to do any work. And paint is one of those things they don't want to do. Simply painting out the room in a more broad appeal color can make all the difference in the world. Do the work for the buyer if you want to sell the house. Here we had an example of a room that was very blue with walls and blue carpet. We didn't have the budget to swap out the carpet, but they were able to paint themselves, and just changing the wall color diminished the sense of blue in that room enough that it sold right away. Here's an example of a house that had been on the market for a full year, no offers, very little foot traffic, and the problem there was very strong personal taste paint and wallpaper in every single room. And you can see in the before photo, dark green in the living room, highlighter pen yellow in the sunroom. By painting everything a unified, soothing grayish that appeals to everyone, this house felt so much calmer and more updated, and it sold literally in 48 hours after a year of not being able to, to sell. Paint was, was the main change. So I want to share a paint tip with you. I want to caution you against recommending white paint throughout. I know a lot of you will say paint it white because it's a safe choice. However, your seller will frequently choose a very cold, sterile white, and you can end up with an effect that feels cold and puts off a buyer, um, and it will negatively impact the appeal. Your buyers will go through, and they won't put their finger on why it doesn't feel like home. It just sort of feels cold and it could be the paint. And if I had a nickel for every time I'd walked into a house and said, all right, one of the first things I'm going to recommend is that we paint these walls a warmer color. It will look richer and feel more inviting. And this seller has turned to me and said, um, I just paid $1,100 to paint these white because my agent told me to do that. So we don't want to end up in that situation. One of the problems, another problem with painting everything white is your seller will have white walls and white trim. Your moldings add value to the home, so we want to highlight the moldings. A trick that decorators use for concealing something is to paint it the same color so it will sort of disappear and melt into the background. You want a subtle contrast to highlight the moldings because you're selling those moldings. You can see here in this example, soft contrast makes the room feel rich, but it highlights the moldings. So there is a safe color choice that I can recommend. It works in most homes. It's a rare one around here that it doesn't look good in, actually. 
Um, Benjamin Moore makes a color called Revere Pewter. Stock number is HC172. It looks delicious with white dove trim. It's neutral. It has just enough warm and just enough cool color in it to work with everybody's furniture. It looks rich and expensive. I've, I, it's rare to find something that doesn't look good next to it. Works with all wood tones and floors. Reflects light very well. You find it in almost every designer show house. Very broad appeal. It makes a home feel expensive and it sells like hotcakes. And I expect it to remain on trend for several years to come. The gray tones are still very popular. If you have wallpaper, recommend that your seller remove it. And your seller is not going to want to, usually. The buyers do not want to deal with it. Most buyers will tell you that when they're flipping through the listing photos to try to figure out which properties they're going to get in the car and see, if they see wallpaper, it doesn't make their short list. So they're really, your seller is really narrowing his buyer pool dramatically if he doesn't remove the wallpaper. I'll share a tool with you to help you convince your seller later. In this example, by removing the wallpaper and painting a, a, a generic broad appeal color, we solved the problem. This, this property had been sitting on the market for a year. This was the example I showed you earlier that sold in 48 hours after we painted and removed wallpaper. And you can see why here. Just a, a second on vacant homes. Some of you are, um, out there will be of the opinion that vacant homes don't need to be staged. There's no bad furnishing in them. I am of the opinion that, yes, a vacant home shows better than a badly furnished home, but it doesn't show nearly as well as a well-furnished home. And when you remember that you're competing against other homes, there will be the furnished ones that will show better, and you don't want to be at a competitive disadvantage. When buyers are flipping through those photos to narrow down their shortlist, when you look at 25 photos of a vacant home, they all look like this one. Walls and windows, walls and windows, walls and windows, walls and windows. It gets a little boring when you're flicking through pictures, click, 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 because that's about how fast they're going. Nothing's jumping out the page at them. When you furnish the room, now there's something that will jump out and be memorable that will cause them to put this house on the short list. In addition, if you notice in the before shot, you don't really have any sense of how big it is. The after picture is taken at the almost identical angle, and yet look how much larger it looks and feels, not to mention how much more luxurious it feels. So which photo do you think is going to draw the better foot traffic? Furthermore, if there's any negative in a vacant house, your buyer has nothing else to look at but the negative, so you just put it on display. So a couple of, uh, just a couple of many reasons why I suggest vacant homes should be staged. Let's talk about the assets that we want to make sure the buyers are focused on, because staging is about focusing the buyer's attention to the assets. We talked about light and space being assets that sell homes. Hardwood floors are, are a good asset that buyers love. Architectural moldings add value. Bay windows, especially with beautiful views and private views. Outdoor living areas are big assets more and more these days. Fireplaces, indoors or outdoors, they're assets. Spa, fancy spa showers and rain heads. Um, and stainless steel appliances all make the buyer's asset list. These are things they're looking for in properties. So if we have them, we want to flaunt them. If you got it, flaunt it, as they used to say. So how do we, how do we highlight those assets? Well, let's say the asset is a nice floor. Remove all unnecessary area rugs. Show as much of that floor as possible. You may want to keep some small rugs to really pull together, if you have sparse furnishings, to really pull together a comfortable seating area, but don't make it larger than you need to because you don't want to cover more floor than you need. Furthermore, when the floor is exposed, as we've said before, it also highlights the light coming in, so you've got a two-for-one there. We've already talked about how paint can highlight the moldings with a subtle contrast. By the way, I think subtle, the more subtle the contrast, the more expensive something feels. When you have stark contrast, it tends to feel like a lower value. Furniture arrangement can be used to highlight assets. 
as you see in the before and after example on the right, by rearranging the furniture as well as toning down the bright red, we were able to focus the buyer's attention on the hardwood floors, the fireplace, and the big window overlooking a private view. Before, you were just focused on red and chaos in the middle. So furniture arrangement can do a lot uh, toward focusing the buyer's attention. You use window treatments to highlight your bay windows and your nice views. Exposing the window panes it will maximize the sense of light and views and the windows. If you have outdoor areas, do your best to, to furnish them and show the buyer how they can extend their lifestyle right outside. Don't make the buyer picture anything if possible. I usually recommend focusing the furniture on the fireplace if you have one. It's your primary asset generally. Um, and it gives you a good, comfortable um, arrangement that really draws the eye where you want it. So let's talk about how do you know if your seller has done enough to sell the property. You, you need them to do enough, but they don't want to do any more than they have to, and they don't want to spend a penny. So the best way to get them to, to find that point that's enough is to work with your seller, make sure they understand they're entering a competition when they put their house up for sale. They're thinking about it from the standpoint that they fell in love with this house and they know someone else will too. They're thinking about their house in a vacuum. They need to understand that it's the buyer is looking, the potential buyer is looking at their house and there are hundreds of others that they have the option to look at as well. And they're going to put the offer in on the one that appeals to them the most. So they want to be the one that appeals the most if they want to win this competition. You know where to draw the line after you study the comps for sale and you know what other options that potential buyer has. You also need to be familiar with your buyer demographics. What assets are those buyers looking for? What appeals to them and what doesn't? Is it a retired couple downsizing? Or is it a 25-year-old, 30-year-old looking for their first home? Or a 40-year-old moving up with, with growing children? It makes a difference what they're looking for. And you need to know what they want and what your client's listing offers and what the competitor's client's listings offer. Do you have more assets than they do? If not, can you get there? You need to be better than the next best competition if you want to get the best offer and get the first offer. So these are the kind of questions you need to, to ask and your seller needs to, to understand so that they realize that if they only need to do a little bit to compete and be the best, great. But they might, if, if you look at the competition and they need to do a little more to keep up with them and get in the running for an offer, that's how you set the bar, okay? You need to know how you stack up. The buyer is going to put their offer in on the house that gets them as close to their dream lifestyle as possible for the least amount of money, the best value. Let's talk about dream lifestyle and how we can plant the seeds of that in the buyer's mind. If you're selling the dream, what is it? It might be lovely, carefree, entertaining. It might be ease of maintenance. It might be more room and storage. Maybe they're moving up from their current home. That could mean looking for more space for their stuff. Because let's face it, most people don't sell their stuff. They move up and get a bigger house to keep all their stuff. So they're looking for room for it. Or it might be they're ready for more luxury. Maybe they're downsizing so it'll be easier for them to take care of it. Either way, we want to work toward planting the seeds of that, um, that dream lifestyle for them. So many people are moving because they need more room for stuff. So that tells us we should present cupboards and closets no more than 75% full. Subliminally, that says to the potential buyer, we had plenty of room for stuff here. You won't open the doors and it won't fall on your head. Clean and organized also contributes to a sense of calm, orderly life, tranquility, no wrestling with things. Little things you can do to, to push that image. Turn cans and boxes in the pantry with their label face forward, standing upright. No little bags spilling off of shelves and boxes tipped over on their sides. 
put all the little little cluttery bags of things in a little container and just spend a second to turn all the labels. It really contributes to a marvelous sense of calm. Dream lifestyle didn't include housework. That's part of the nightmare. We don't want to wake the buyer up from their dream. So I recommend hiding cleaning products. We don't want to remind them of housework in a showing. So for photos and for showings, box them up, let the house look like it cleans itself. For the same reason, I recommend removing garbage cans. Frequently, you walk in a kitchen, and at the end of the island, there's that three-foot-tall stainless steel dome top trash can. It goes out in the garage or into a pantry or something for showings. I also recommend putting in fluffy white spa towels in your bathrooms, but I also recommend keeping them just for show. Use your regular towels, and as soon as you know you have either photos or a showing, pull out a box with the show towels, put them up, and hide yours and box them and, and put them away while you're boxing up your cleaning products. You don't want to use them because once you do, you have to wash them, and when you do that, they no longer look as white and fluffy and luxurious. Use them when you get to your next house. Hide personal hygiene products also. Anything having to do with dirt or maintenance or things like that, we just box up and keep out. So now on to listing photos, one of your most crucial components of selling a property these days. More and more, actually. Studies show that now over 90% of buyers will rule out which properties they, they rule in and rule out the properties they're going to get in the car and see based on going online and flipping through photos first. You've got to make the short list. Gone are the days, the old-fashioned days, where you had your, your multiple listing book, buyers needed you, and you could sort through and, and drive them around. Now, they go online, they see which ones they want to see. So that means your photos are one of the most critical components of your marketing strategy. They've got to look good because that's how you're going to draw foot traffic to your listing. I want you to consider what I call the HGTV effect. The bar has been raised because these buyers are looking at before and after transformations on TV. They want their house to look like the after, and the younger they are, the less work they're willing to do to get it there. They want their first home to look just like HGTV. That's raised the bar. The house that was acceptable condition 10 years ago may not cut it now. And the seller, if they haven't sold a house in a while, really needs to understand that. They've got to make sure that their house is styled and ready for its close-up when the photographer shows up. Here's an example of a seller who just missed the mark. He obviously tidied up and decluttered, but the pictures are still leaning against the wall, and they didn't make it up to, the, to hanging in time before the photographer showed up. Have your drapes open and your lights on. Make sure you do a check. We, we're all guilty of having done this at least once, probably. No coats dangling over the sofa in sight in the picture. No purses or briefcases visible. Make sure the vacuum cleaner and the trash can and things have been removed. And you may giggle when you see pots and pans and think that's silly, but it took me five minutes to find a picture um, when I went through looking for examples of, of how not to do how not to, to do listing photos. There was a picture. I was not able to get permission to show it here, unfortunately. All of the pictures I use are either my own, or if they say trend, they're shown with permission. There was a picture of a kitchen, cabinets all open, every pot and pan they owned, all over the countertops. This was their listing photo of the kitchen. Obviously, I recommend against that. Um, so make sure you do a check for all those things before you put in the photo. Here's an example with the vacuum cleaner sitting in the middle of the room. I would have removed the fan. I also would have recommended the silly little green window treatments be removed. They weren't adding anything, uh, among other things. Make sure you're photographing the assets. This listing has to make that online cut or you're not going to get buyers in the car and through the front door. Post favorable shots. You've got to get them through the door. Big tip. You want to post the well-staged photos from day one because you want to capture your biggest wave of interest, which, as you know, occurs in the first two to three weeks after you list a property. You're going to get the bell curve goes way up and then trickles down after that. So why would you wait 
to have fabulous photos and do all of the, the staging until after that's passed. So if your seller says, well, let's just do it this way, and if we have to do more after a couple weeks, we will, they would miss that big wave. You need to encourage them to be ready on day one. With that said, if they do go ahead and make improvements after, you still want to post updated photos. And I'd like to share an example um, of a house that I saw about a year ago. I, was, uh, I saw an open house right around the corner from me, and it was listed by an agent that I'd not worked with before. And I saw it online. It looked awful. It really needed staging badly. So I went in to introduce myself and offer my services. And when I walked in the door, I nearly fainted. The place looked gorgeous. It had been staged beautifully, uh, very elaborately. It showed quite well. But the agent never posted updated photos, so nobody knew it looked that good, and she wasn't getting any foot traffic and couldn't figure out why. So if there are improvements made later, don't forget to update your listing photos. Let's move on to some very basic furniture arrangement tips. Uh, again, though, knowing that I'm not trying to teach you how to do the decorating staging portion of this. That's where you call in a specialist. Your time is better spent marketing. I want you to recognize scenarios where you know immediately this is, contributing, this is what's contributing to an awkward feeling. This is a scenario that I know could be improved quickly and easily and with great benefit. And here's where I should call someone. Obviously, fireplaces are assets, so we don't want to block the view of that. Um, often you'll find a piece of furniture right across the fireplace because they don't want their kids to, to get in the fireplace. Um, you don't want to block assets. You don't want to block entryways or traffic routes or windows either. So if you see furniture blocking them, consider consulting for uh, a better furniture arrangement. Personally, I feel if you see a lot of wooden dressers lined up or wooden pieces side by side, it contributes to a somewhat awkward feel, and frequently there's a better way to arrange the furniture. Here's an example in that picture on the right. You also want to encourage tight conversational groupings. When you see f furniture all lined up against a wall, all lined up, they're like little soldiers on the wall, and the person on one end has to crane their neck and sort of scream to the person on the opposite end. It's not comfortable. It doesn't draw you in. And while the buyer won't understand why, they won't feel like lingering in that room. When you pull a tighter conversational grouping, it invites you to linger, and it contributes to that sense of uh, this one feels more like home. If you see dingy recliners, if they're not adding, consider whether that recliner should go with the extra money you make when you sell faster and for a higher price, you can buy a much nicer recliner for the new house. I don't like to see a view behind wood furniture. Uh, I think that contributes to an awkward sense. These are the things, all these little things that you can't, the buyer won't put their finger on why it isn't clicking. Often you'll walk into a master bedroom and you'll see a, a tall dresser with a TV on top and because you're looking at the side of the dresser, it's right in front of the doorway, you, and there's a nice thick baseboard at the bottom, you've got a six-inch gap between the dresser back and the wall, and there's all these wires you're looking at. You don't want to be looking at that. Which also makes me think of the fact that you want to do as much as you can to conceal and contain cables and wires. So if you see a, a lamp, uh, the plug extends across the wall and the cord sticking out, and you're seeing cord, can you move the piece of furniture? Can you tape the cord to a leg and move it so that you don't see it sticking out? Um, if you have a, a, a whole bunch of wires, can you conceal them in one of those tubes you buy at, at um, a big box store that will contain them? It can be painted and taped to the wall to hold them in place. The little tricks that you can do, sometimes you put a plant in front of it or a basket. I recommend sticking with the larger pieces and losing the small pieces. Even in a small home, if you're trying to select which pieces of furniture should stay and which should go, generally you, you're better off keeping one large piece and losing all the little cluttery ones. In many rooms, often your ideal photo, most dramatic view, will come from placing the bed on the wall that you're going to see, one of the two walls you'll see from the doorway. 
you usually get your strongest photo. The example here, this is the same bedroom as the picture on the top. And by moving the bed to the back, we gain drama, and we also split the dressers up. Kill two birds with one stone again. In dining rooms, I generally suggest reducing the number of chairs at the dining table. Unless it's a huge room, I usually suggest only four chairs. Remove extra leaves. You want room for people to walk around the table. Consider when you're selling that there are more people walking through a room than you normally have in real life, all at the same time. So you're going to have agents and a couple and their kids or their friends, and they're all walking through the same room at the same time. You need wider traffic paths than normal lifestyle requires. And so that helps getting around the dining room easier. And for the same reason, consider removing the china cabinet, if they will, and instead putting up a nice, dramatic, large piece of art. And that'll contribute to the sense of space that sells homes. So again, just tips. If you see these things, this is when you talk to a specialist and have them work with you to help you. If your seller has been very cooperative and they've cleaned and decluttered and done everything you asked, you may end up with a blank, boring slate like this beautifully photographed example. So now what? Bringing in a stager can help you add that wow factor back. And I would like to offer a tip here. If you suspect you're going to need a stager, my best advice to you is bring them in as early as you possibly can. They might have a better paint suggestion, like the example I gave you earlier today, or prefer different furniture get removed. They might surprise you, and they might have a better use of the seller's funds and their time. So bring them in before it's too late. It makes a big difference. One of the advantages of working with another stager with you, um, working as a team, it gives you the opportunity to play good cop, bad cop. You protect your relationship with the client, and if there's a touchy situation like, gee, your house really reeks of dog odor or um, you know, things like that, let the stager take on some of the tougher conversations and you can protect your relationship. I also find that if you have told the client you must do A, B, and C, and then you bring in someone that you build up as a specialist and they say you must do A, B, and C, two things happen. One, it reinforces what your expertise level with them. And two, one more person telling them, they're more likely to do it. And it's also a little bit like when you tell your kids to do something and they don't listen to you, but someone else tells them the exact same thing and suddenly they're excited about it. Use human psychology to your advantage. You want to remember that the best use of your time is marketing this listing and going out and getting another listing. That's where you get paid the big bucks. Let the stager use their time and skills doing what they do best, and together as a team, you'll get farther. They're already trained on They've probably run across the situation before. They'll have the resources to deal with it, and you're going to get the maximum impact from staging when you work together like that as a team. So now I'd like to move on to a study of properties that have lingered. This is the how not to sell section that I talked about. I did a, a quick search. It only took me a few minutes. This, at the time I did this search, I, I searched for properties that had been on the market at least 90 days, and they'd had at least one price reduction. And I want to share some examples with you. I, I analyzed to see what commonalities we might find. And these all show examples of the turnoffs that we have talked about. So as you look at these pictures, think about what you would have advised your sellers if this was your listing and how much equity your sellers might have saved if they had made just a tiny investment in staging. These, are all, these were all active published listing photos. These aren't my before pictures. These are, um, and I was not involved in any of these, these are actual listing photos. So you have to ask yourself, do they portray that dream lifestyle? Do we see effortless entertaining? Do we see upgrading from where we are? Do we feel harmony and tranquility and luxury? So let's see, example number one. This home was listed at the very top of its price range by a mile. It had been listed once, expired, and was about to expire for the second time. There were a good seven photos of that top room from every conceivable angle. 
So let's look at the turnoffs that we've found here. We have wallpaper border. We have furniture lined up like soldiers along the wall in the top picture. We have our windows blocked with plants everywhere. We have dated window treatments in both, fix in both pictures. We have, did I mention the wallpaper border already? We have the photographer's bag in the doorway. We've blocked the light with a closed window and with plants. Um, we have a creepy feeling from the plants in the kitchen. That lower picture is a kitchen, and the only way you can tell is you can see the magnets on the black refrigerator on the right, if you look closely. How could we have fixed this? Well, we could have opened the, the window treatments in the kitchen area to the maximum, and that would have minimized the florals, or we could have removed them free. We could remove all the plants so that nothing grabs us in the head when we walk into the, the kitchen, because they're dangling from the skylight. Um, we could remove all of the plants and window treatments in the room upstairs. We could pull that furniture in to a more comfortable conversational grouping. We could obviously take the duffel bag out of the, the picture. We could suggest they remove the wallpaper. I would suggest that the top picture looks like it was a sectional. I see the tag on the lining. It looks like the seat cushions are missing. I would put it back together again and find a way to, to cover the, the bare lining there, I'd find out where those cushions are, and I'd put fresh flowers on the breakfast table. For the cost of fresh flowers, we've vastly improved the way this shows. Here's an example of a lovely house. It really had a lot of things going for it. We have a lovely paint color. We have a large space. We have fireplace, hardwood floors, Nice light gleaming off the hardwood floors. Um, lots going for it. But I think the reason this property lingered is it doesn't draw you in. You don't feel like staying and sitting in that living room because of the furniture arrangement. If this were my client, I would have said, let's take that coffee table and put it on the trunk. We put it on top of the area rug. Now we've exposed more hardwood floor. And let's pull all the furniture in and center it around that rug which is centered on the fireplace. Now we're sh merchandising the floors and the fireplace, and we're creating a sense of comfort to draw you in. That black leather chair on the left has to crane their neck to talk to somebody on the sofa. If we pulled it in together like that, then it would be a very comfortable feeling, and you would not have to walk through the conversational group to get to the next room. I would also suggest we have all this art lined up on the fireplace wall, and the fireplace is sort of hidden among all the things lined up. When the furniture is pulled away, it will begin to show more, especially since the furniture will be focused on it. You see the two stronger, bolder pictures on the right, the larger ones? I would take those two and put them side by side over the fireplace and remove the other ones, and the focus would be drawn whoosh, straight to the fireplace. The top one is an example. Well, both of these are examples of wood pieces lined up in a row. In the top one, photo is taken from the doorway. You walk in, you're sort of behind and have to peek around a piece of large furniture to see the bed, and then there's another large piece of furniture. So the bed almost feels a little bit like it's in a storeroom surrounded by big pieces. I would separate those. I would remove at least one. I would probably take that little scatter rug on the floor, and I'd hang it up like a headboard over the bed to add some color. This room needs softness, and it needs color. You could further that by putting up window treatments in the, in the windows very inexpensively, and that would soften and give an opportunity for additional color. In the bottom example, feels like the room is tilting off to the right because all the furniture is on the right-hand side. This is also taken from the doorway, it appears. I would put that bed where the dresser is, where the, the, night, the uh, dressing table is, I would trade positions. So you're looking at the headboard, and the dressing table is where the headboard used to be. And I would take that tall dresser with the TV. I'd move it to the right of the window. Furniture would be spread around, and it would look dynamite. You don't want to block passageways. And here is a listing photo where we see uh, two problems. One, the fireplace is an asset, but my view of it is stopped first by a bright, colorful children's toy. Haul that out of there so that the focus goes straight to the fireplace. The second asset is this open plan that's being blocked by the sofa. If we move the sofa to the wall opposite, we'd solve that problem for free. Here's an example, again, of a home with very personal taste walls on the market for a year, all feedback 
the seller's agent told me, everybody says, oh, it just needs to be painted and I'm not willing to do it. Just proves that 85% of the buyers don't want to do the work. Remember that from your last class. Had the seller simply spent a few weekends painting, they could move this property because it's a lovely townhome. Cast a wider net with more neutral colors. Here's a room that the seller probably thinks they've staged. They've done a nice job of, of decluttering and, and bringing in accessories. But this is if you see in the bottom picture, you can tell from the top one that you're standing in the doorway when you look at the bottom one. From the doorway, you see a blocked passage to the dining room. There was plenty of room to rotate that furniture and put the, the sofa on the long wall. And if we rotated the whole thing, we would also um, move the TV, and then we would no longer be blocking the window. Simple rearranging and rotating would make a big difference. So again, I'm not trying to teach you how to arrange furniture. I'm just trying to teach you the red flags that you saw here. Blocked window, blocked passageway, blocked view of a fireplace, dressers lined up, etc. Your job as an agent is to help the seller protect their equity as best as possible. And staging is a great tool to help you do that. And I know a lot of agents are a little bit intimidated by staging because they think it's expensive. But I hope that you've learned so far in your certification, both sessions have shown you it can be free, it can be a couple hundred dollars. It does not have to be an expensive proposition. Certainly, staging costs are much cheaper than the price reductions that these people have had to take in the examples you saw. Spending a few hundred on staging can save thousands in price reductions, so it's well worth the expense. Consultations are not pricey. Something I learned from Russ Fitzpatrick that really stuck with me. The very best agents across the country are particularly good at shifting responsibility to the sellers. It's your responsibility to market the property, but it's the seller's responsibility the product that they gave you to market and the quality of it. The seller needs to understand that. And staging is your vehicle to improve the quality of the product that you're selling. So I'd like to share with you some tools that will help you. You understand this, but now the next challenge is your seller needs to understand this. Some tools that I can offer for you that will help. I offer photo consultations. If you want, you can upload, I'll give you a link, and you can upload photos, drag and drop them into my link. We set up a phone conversation, and we can go through whether it's just one problem, one room, or the entire house. I only bill in 15-minute increments, so you only pay for what you need. And I think you got a hint from the, the study of the listings that linger there are a lot of suggestions we can make based off of just photos alone. And that was just a hint of the depth we can go into in a consultation. It's only a $50 minimum. It's, I, I priced it to be a no-brainer. Um, there are a lot of agents that take advantage of it. Something out there for you to consider. I mentioned at the beginning that I had a tool to help you in your listing presentation. I have a kit that has some sheets you can use either digitally if you use a, an iPad or um, print out if you use a, a notebook version. And there's a little flyer there on why a seller should stage a staged home. Um, and it also has a recipe for sale, all the ingredients you need that need to align in order for a sale to happen. And it shows them how the, most con the one element over which they have the most control is the condition of the house. And staging is such a huge component of that. They control it so much. There's a stat sheet on how much faster they can sell and how much more money they can make. Um, and I also have some tips for you on how to maximize the benefits of staging. And I include some photo examples you can show your client to say, look, with a $100 expense and very simple uh, staging tricks, look how, much more, uh, look how much better this property shows. If you need discounts on pods, if you don't have any for off-site storage, I offer my discount code. And there's a sample of a customizable gift certificate and some marketing suggestions on how you might want to use that as well. You can order that on my website at stagecoachservices.com. The next tool that I would like to share is your secret weapon for the wallpaper issue that we were talking about. 
I, at the request of, of um, a real estate agent that I work with, after a brainstorming session, um, she was asking for something very professional to give to clients to help them develop the right mindset to make the right decisions when we tell them uh, staging recommendations. And so this book is actually 72 pages, full color illustrated guidebook of tips, 258 tips. It's mostly pictures with little tips written underneath. It's not a reading assignment. They flip through the pictures and they get curious and they end up absorbing the whole thing. And in it, there's a sheet on why they should sell a staged home and these items that were in the, the listing kit um, they'll get to see and keep in the book. It also includes a detailed staging checklist uh, with generic tips that apply to everyone, tips for best showings, an open house checklist. It goes through the common buyer turnoffs and how to address them. And it's easier for the seller to recognize uh, um, poor showing conditions in someone else's home where they don't have any personal connection to it. And they don't take any personal offense when they see it and understand that this is something that could stand in their way. And they can see how quickly and simply and inexpensively it can be resolved. It also includes a more extensive study of listings that linger, including one with wallpaper. And if you have a seller with wallpaper and you hand them this book, it will tell them why they need to remove it in no uncertain terms. And I have found I have never had such good results in getting sellers to remove wallpaper as I have since this book was starting to be passed out. This is your secret weapon. The wallpaper is coming down as a result. So that page alone um, is worth its weight in gold for you if it will help. You can order them one at a time on my website. There is a tab for real estate agents and these tools. You'll find them there. If you want to order in bulk, uh, discounts are available. Contact me by email and we can discuss pricing. I'm also available if you would like private coaching or group coaching to make it very affordable with no contract time limits just as needed. And if you would like me to come out to your brokerage and conduct any training classes, I am more than happy to do that as well. You may find that very helpful. Um, so I hope that you have found this, this session to be a benefit. I'd like to share one last story before wrapping up. My dear friend is a real estate agent. She's been a top producing agent for 20 years at her company. And she wasn't initially very big on staging. And when I started my staging practice, she came across a really a, a, a listing that showed very poorly. And she threw me a bone and had me stage it. And it sold right away. So whenever she had something that showed really badly, she called me in. After she read that book of tips, something clicked for her, and she understood the bigger picture, which is what you are fortunate enough to get in this certification. When you go through your next session, I hope you see the genius of how this is put together. Um, when she finally figured out how to use staging in the big picture and how it could help, and why it was better to do it at the beginning, like you're going to be taught here, she suddenly, something clicked, and she suddenly had me come in on every single listing she took. Her business shot up to the next level. Life has been so much easier and more profitable for her. She says staging is her magic weapon, and she would never consider going back to doing business the old way. Whoever does your staging with you, I wish for you that same aha moment, that same success that she's experienced, because when you learn how to use staging right, it will change everything for you. And so I close with my best wishes that that happens for you. Best of luck to all of you, and thank you.